What's going on Instagram? It is Derek back in the Embark Studios for the second time this week here in Whippany, New Jersey. I am excited to be with you guys. I'm uh, uh, producing my own set today, a little bit more up close and personal. Um, for those of you who were not with us on Monday, had a great session with Embark Essentials. Uh, we talked about the most important or the most common question uh, that that a lot of young adults, a lot of youth, a lot of people have, uh, and we'll get to that. Really, just laid the foundation. Before we get into the word today, uh, I wanna I wanna pray, and I want to uh, for all of us to open up our hearts and our minds to start receiving uh, the word that the Lord has for us today. Is going to be a meaty, meaty uh, session. Um, all of the resources, all of the scriptures, everything that uh, that I go over today, and everything that I went over on Monday will be listed in post to follow, but this is gonna be a session that you're gonna to wanna to watch over and over again to get these scriptures planted within your spirit, to, med to meditate on them so that you can start to build your life on them. So, Father, I thank you for the time that I have here with my brothers and sisters. I thank you. I thank you for the ability that, that we have to gather, uh, not even in person, but to gather using the technology in this, in this day and time where we can press into you where we can seek your kingdom, where we can seek your face, where we can learn your word and we can hear your preaching miles apart from each other and that we can go back again and again and again and receive good preaching and good teaching. Father, I thank you for the word that you've given me. I thank you for the revelation that you've given me. I thank you for what you've shown me and I thank you for using me as a vessel to deliver it to your people to set them free. I thank you for the word that will proceed forth today and I I decree and I thank you that the, the soil that this word will get planted in, the, the soil of people's souls and the soil of people's spirits is good and clean soil, that there may be no corrupt thing within the soil to choke out the seed which is planted, but that each seed may be planted, may begin to germinate, may grow, and will grow to produce a 30, 60, yet 100-fold return so that we as the unified body of Christ in this last hour of time may move as a singular unit, may, may do your will here on the earth, may bring heaven down, may bring heaven from out of us, and redefine the world around us by the, by the kingdom of heaven that you've placed within us. Father, I give you all the honor and the glory for this, that you, that that us as your unified body, that the world will look at us and know that you sent your son to die for us and that the world will know that you love us just as much as you love him. Father, I thank you for making us your children. I thank you for, for unifying us by your name as a singular body, as a Holy Ghost Terminator army of the body of Christ in this last hour of time to go out and reap the greatest harvest of souls that this world has ever seen. We pray this, we agree on it, and we thank you for it in the mighty, awesome, wonderful, phenomenal, stupendous, undefeated name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. Awesome. So we're going to get, like I said, we're going to get deep into the word. I have tons of scriptures for you guys. Like I said, if you're, if you're reading uh, along in your word, uh, you can follow along, go back and watch it again to get all the scriptures down, but I'll also be posting everything again. So the most common question. I'm just going to uh, go over briefly what we covered on Monday and give you the scriptures behind what I was talking about then. Then we're going to go into uh, how to access the answer, how to access the answer to the most common question. The most common question is, what is my purpose? What is my calling? What, what am I created to do? What am I here for? And really, uh, we as believers, we need to know the answer to that. The only reasons that people stop asking that question is because they either are confident in the answer, which majority of people, majority of Christians aren't, it's sad to say the majority of Christians are not aware of why they've been created, what they've been purposed for. So the, uh, the reasons we stop asking that question is because we either know the answer or we don't know the answer and we don't believe that there is an answer, so we stop asking, or we get to a point where we think that the answer doesn't even exist, which is why uh, it's a prevalent question with youth and young adults. Um, but you find with a lot of adults, a lot of adults are not living in their purpose, but they're not asking the question because it's been so beaten out of them by the world that they, they a lot of them don't even believe that there, that there is an answer to that question. Now, I'm going to go through a lot of scripture today, and the reason that we are going to do this is because faith begins where the Word of God is known. Faith begins where the Word of God is known. 
Um, so it's important to know the scriptures that are that uh, that are founding what we're talking about today. So the foundation. Step one: understanding the foundation of of having a purpose. We talked about this on Monday, part A. There is a specific purpose for which you've been created. We have to know that. Jeremiah 1.5. Um, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. I knew you and I ordained you as a prophet. I ordained you. Uh, God knew us before he created us. Before we manifested physically on this earth, he knew us and created us for a purpose. Jeremiah 29.11. I know the thoughts I have towards you. I know the plan I have towards you, says the Lord. Plans, plans for hope and a future. Plans to prosper you. John, uh, John 17, 4, and like I said, if you, if you have your Bible, flip around. If not, go to, go, just jot these down and, and study them on your own. You want to see them with your own eyes. John 17, 4, just as Jesus speaking, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. So Jesus is saying, this is towards the end of his, his earthly ministry. He is praying to God. This is the last prayer he says before he goes up on the cross. Uh, documented in the in the in the book of John, and he says, "Lord, I have glorified by finishing the work which you've sent me to do. I have given you glory." And then he goes on to say, in John seventeen eighteen, and again in John twenty twenty one, "As the Father has sent me, so send I you." So if God sent Jesus to do a specific work, and Him by doing that work gave glory to the Father, and we've been sent the same way, that means that we have a work to do. We have a work to do. Uh, John 6, John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So the will, what the work that we've been sent to do is, is not our own. It's the will of our, of our Father. The one who sends us is the one who sent us with the work. So that's part A. There is a specific purpose for which you've been created. Part B. Your purpose being fulfilled. First of all, it's up to you. We talked about God is not in control. That video is, is on YouTube. Um, if you search my name or go to the Abundant Life Whippany account to watch that. Your purpose being fulfilled, which is up to us, will have a direct or indirect impact on the amount of people that make heaven. That is a heavy responsibility, but that is what we're commissioned to do. Everything that the body of Christ as a whole and individual members of the body, everything that we've been sent to do will either directly lead souls coming to Christ or indirectly impact it. Uh, for example, I gave this example on, on Monday. You might be called to the business world. You might be called to prosper in, out in the business world so you can finance and fund the preaching of the gospel because it takes money. The Bible says money answers all things. Everything that we have a desire to do requires money to do it. And the Lord wants to provide, but he needs to use a vessel to provide for it. Um, there's also people littered throughout scripture who were politicians that were used of the Lord. David was a politician. He, he was a king. That's not a, that's not a ministry position. That is a political position. Daniel, he was high, He was second in the government. That is a political position. Joseph, political position. And they were able to, yes, be used by God and carry influence in those positions, but they were also able to open the door for the gospel to be preached. So your purpose, you, we need to understand this. And the church, we as the church need to do a much better job of letting people know who are not called to full-time ministry that your purpose, your calling still matters eternally. It's not just the people who are called to preach that have an eternal impact. It's every single one of us. Again, John 6, 38, come down to do the will of him who sent me. And uh, if we if we want to understand how our part fits in, if we're let's say we're not called to full time ministry, let's say you are called to business, you're called to teach, you're called to to politics. We need to understand what the will of God and how you fit into that. Second Peter three nine, God is not being slack concerning His promises, but He for God is willing that no man should perish. We talked about this on Monday. What God allows to happen has nothing to do with His will. The mentality that everything that happens is a part of God's will is an absolute lie that is, uh, that is um, deceiving the body of Christ into being stagnant, into not being proactive, into allowing things that are not scriptural to exist in our own lives, to exist in the world around us, 
It is our responsibility. We are the body of Christ here on the earth, and it is our responsibility to bring heaven here. The greatest gift, I'm going off in a little different direction, I'll come back. The greatest gift that God gave the world was his son, Jesus Christ. But the greatest gift that God gave the church is the Holy Spirit. Because by the Holy Spirit living inside of us, we can be as Christ. As Christ is, so are we in this world. And as the body of Christ, we are meant to walk the same way, talk the same way, live the same way, do the same things that Christ did and greater things. And that is for every single believer. We are supposed to live at that level. And we have to understand that God is willing that no man should perish. So he's giving us more time so that all people can come to repentance. But for that to happen, we each have to play a role. John 17, 21 to 23. Jesus, again, Jesus is praying. This is the last prayer he says before he goes up on the cross. I do not pray for these alone. I do not pray for just these disciples, but for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Just like we prayed in the very beginning, God wants the world to believe that he sent Jesus. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. Talks about being unified. I in them and you and me that they may be made perfect in one, one perfect body, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Again, that's John 17, 21 to 23. Flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, we're going to read ver- uh, verse 26. It's talking about the body of Christ now. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. I would read from uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 26 for the sake of time. Just going to highlight that one verse. That each member... Again, I said this on, on Monday when people ask me, what, well, what's my purpose? I don't care what your purpose is. I don't care what it is. And that's not saying that I, I, I don't care about you or I don't care um, that you're fulfilling it, but I don't care if it's one thing or the other. I believe that you have one and I, want, and I, and I really care that you're living at the highest level and you're pursuing it with everything you've got so that we can, as a body, uh, be, be, be unified. If one member suffers, all the members suffer. So if you or me is not living up to the level of which we've been created to live, then the entire body suffers. And this is re-emphasized in in, the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. Uh, For the sake of time, I'm just going to read 15 to 16. But speaking the truth in love... We, as the body, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effect of working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. You have a purpose. You have a, an important role to play. It does not matter what that role is, it, but it matters that you identify it and that you walk in it because it affects the rest of the body. Love this quote. I don't know if I came up with this on my own or if I saw it somewhere. I didn't write down a name after it. But if you are doing, if what you are doing with your life is not assisting the body of Christ in winning souls to Jesus, you are not walking in your calling. And we all need to realize that. Okay, so A, there's a specific purpose for which you've been created. B, your purpose being fulfilled will have a direct or indirect impact on souls making heaven. And C, God desires for you to fill your pur- fulfill your purpose even more than you do. We have to get rid of this mentality that God teaches by destruction, that, God, that, that he makes us go through chaos. Yes, he makes us go through process, but the process does not always involve messing up. Process can simply be honoring the people who he's put above us, obeying them. God honors obedience, and he's put people in our lives who who have wisdom and who have the spirit of God within them to guide us and correct us. And we can, if we 
ascertain, if we, if we go after their wisdom, we can stand on their shoulders and we don't have to go through the garbage. Just like, just, if everybody has to start at square zero and go, and, and go to the school of hard knocks, then we're, the, as the body of Christ, we're not going to get very far. We're meant to stand on the shoulders of the people who have come before us. And our chief mentor is the Holy Spirit. And by the Holy Spirit, we're lacking nothing. By the Holy Spirit, we lack nothing. We can live, we can walk through this life without even stumbling. Again, God desires for you to fulfill your purpose even more than you do. Why? Because as a member of the body of Christ, because your purpose is linked to souls making heaven, those are his children. Those are his children. He created you for that purpose. So he wants you to fulfill that purpose. Psalm 37, 4. Um, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of the heart. That means when you're delighting yourself in the Lord, you're seeking the kingdom first. The desires that you have, it's not that he'll give you the desire, like he'll just give you whatever you want. The desires that you have when you delight yourself in him are literally planted there by him. He is, he is, he is a, a good father. If us, if we, they believe this is Matthew 7, 11, if we being wicked, if we being evil can give good gifts to our children, how much greater gifts can God give to those who he loves God can give to us who ask of him, but we have to ask of him. Uh, another one, God, God uh, above all, beloved above all things, I pray that you would prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. God wants us to be progressing. There's one more that I have written down here, and I need to reference it. 1 John 5, uh, 14 and 15. Now this is the confidence that we have of him, that if we ask anything according to his will, that we know that he hears us and that we have received what we petitioned for him. So when we pray and we say, God, I know it's your will that no man should perish. I know that my purpose is linked to souls making heaven. Reveal to me my purpose. We can say confidently, God, because I've prayed according to your will, I know that you hear me and I know that you, you are revealing to me now by the spirit, by your word, by every way that you speak to me, you are revealing to me exactly what you put me on this earth to do because it's in your best interest because it's in everyone's best interest because it's your will because you are a good God all right that is the foundation step two and this is what we're getting to today understanding how to access the answer we talked a little bit about this on Monday the only way to access the answer is to lay down your life and quite simply Laying down your life is not the willingness to jump in front of a bullet, but laying down your, it is included in that, being willing to sacrifice yourself, but it goes deeper than that. Laying down your life simply is sowing into your spirit and killing your flesh. Jesus lived a perfect life. He lived a perfect life because he made every single decision with his spirit and not with his flesh. Matthew, I'm going to throw a lot of scriptures at you real quick. And then uh, we're going to wrap up. Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. When we seek after the kingdom of God for our purpose, understanding the foundation that we just laid, we can seek the kingdom because we know that our purpose is found there. It's when we start to chase things for our own benefit. But you look at the things that people are chasing in this world. They're chasing love. They're chasing health. They're chasing prosperity. They're chasing abundance. They're chasing promotion. These are not bad things. God wants you to have them. But if you will seek the kingdom first and, and who, who, your identity in him and what you already have, you'll realize that in the kingdom of God, all those things already belong to you. And if you seek the kingdom and the establishment of his kingdom on this earth, he'll simply give them to you because they already belong to you. John 15... John 15, 13. Greater love has none, no one than this than he who would lay down his life for his friend. Greater love has no one than this than he who would lay down his life for his friend. 1 John three sixteen. We know love because Jesus laid down his life for us. John six fifty one. Tying this all together. John six fifty one. Jesus says that the the um, the the bread that he will give is his flesh. So he, we, the Bible's saying that we, we know love because Jesus laid down his life for us. But he's saying the bread that he gave was his flesh. So how did he lay down his life? He gave his flesh, not just on the cross, but for 33 years. John 17, 
19, I sanctify myself so that these may also be sanctified. I set myself apart, setting yourself apart, laying down the flesh, sowing into your spirit. This is how we lay down our lives. Philippians 2, verses 1 to 8, talks about how Christ... I'll start in verse 3. Let each esteem himself... Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others, being a part of the body, esteeming others greater than yourself. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Here's verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. When Jesus was up on the cross and he said, it is finished, he was not talking about just that one act of being crucified. When Jesus says, it is finished, he's talking about the 33-year process of laying down his life on a minute-to-minute, second-to-second, decision-to-decision basis of every single decision he made killing his flesh and sowing into his spirit. Why? Because he was motivated by the, inf- the, the impact that the, every decision would have on the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, 22 to 24. That you put off concerning your former conduct. How did Jesus do it? You put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Kill your flesh. Kill your flesh. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. We have to understand that we are not our flesh. That in fact, I love this quote. This is a uh, Jonathan Shuttlesworth quote. For those of you who know the uh, great evangelist Jonathan Shuttlesworth. The only struggle that we have as Christians, the only one, if we get this, everything else falls in line. The only struggle we have as Christians is to not let our flesh dominate our spirit. How simple is that? How simple is that and how hard do we make it? 1 John 3.18 1 John 3.18 We talked about this last time too. Little children. This is right after Jesus said by, but or I'm sorry, the Apostle John writes, we knew love because Christ laid down his life for us. Then he follows it up and says, let us not love in word and in tongue. Let us love in deed and in truth. It's not about what, it, it's, yes, our words are powerful. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, but it's not just about the words. Actions speak way louder than words, and faith without works is dead. So it's about receiving a transformation, receiving the revelation within us, being transformed within us, that it changes the very actions and the deeds that we do so that we can lay down our lives, sow into the spirit, kill the flesh, literally beat our flesh into submission so that we can we can fulfill our purpose. Now, all right, so how, couple practical, how to lay down your life tips, how to sow into your spirit, how to kill your flesh. I uh, listed six, I'm sure there's more, um, but these are six that are very clear in the Bible on how to kill your flesh, how to sow into your spirit, how to strengthen your spirit man, how to seek first the kingdom. It all starts with hunger. We know Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts, I know the plans that I think towards you. Obviously, he has a plan for us. Jeremiah 29, 12, and 13, though, equally as important. He says, then, you know I have a plan for you. He says, then, you will seek me and you will pray to me. And I will listen. You will search for me and you will, will, guaranteed, will. He doesn't say you might. He says, you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart, with all of your heart. Um, so it, it, it starts with a hunger. This is the work, the practical stuff. This is something that no one can do for you. This is why the answer to what are you created to do, I can't tell you. I did not create you. I can simply tell you this is how, this is the blueprint that God gave us. He wants us to know, he wants us to know his will for our life. He wants us to know what our purpose is. And he gave us the instructions on how to, how to access it. 
It's right here. We got to get back in the word and know what this says. That's why I'm giving you so many scriptures. You will find it. You will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. So hunger is first one. Second, right choices. Psalm 4, 5 says, offer a sacrifice of righteousness. I love what Bishop Ann Jimenez says about righteousness. She says, righteousness is simply right choices. And the choices, the choices that we have to make will always be between our spirit and our flesh. Righteousness is choosing our spirit. It's that simple. Right choices. A f three practical things. Study. How do we lay down our life? We lay down our life by studying, by getting in the word. John 8, 31 and 32. Everybody knows the truth shall set you free. That's not complete. If you back it up a little bit more, it says you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Still incomplete. You got to take it one more verse before that. Jesus says, if you are my children, you will abide in me. And Jesus is the word of God. So how do we become free? How do we be empowered to make the right choices? How are we empowered to live in our purpose? We have to abide in the word of God. Abide in Jesus. Then we will know the truth. And then the truth will make us free. But it all starts with abiding in the word. John 17, 17 uh, echoes this. He says, sanctify them. This is Jesus praying to the Father. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. We are set apart by the word of God. So we have to have that being sowed into us. So study. An another one, prayer. Luke 22, 46. This is Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, and the disciples fell asleep. And Jesus uh, rebukes them. He says, could you not even pray with me one hour? He says, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Our spirits are not, do not yield to temptation. It's our flesh that yields to temptation. So Jesus is saying here that if you pray, you will prevent yourself from falling into temptation, then obviously prayer is a way that we can sow into our spirit and not into our flesh, especially, especially praying in the spirit, praying in tongues. Roman, Roman says that we do not know what to pray, but the spirit wants to play, pray through us, for us, to God on our behalf. So if, if you're not baptized in the spirit, you need to get baptized in the Spirit. Jesus, has, before going up to heaven, the last thing he told people, the last thing he told the disciples was go and dwell in Jerusalem and don't do anything until the, the promise has come. Because without the promise of the Holy Spirit, we would have been ineffectual. Peter would have never had the boldness to preach that sermon. He still would have ran. We need the power and the boldness, everything that the Holy Spirit carries. So praying in other tongues. Prayer, especially in other tongues. Another one, fasting. John 4, 34. The, uh, the disciples at this point offer food to Jesus. And Jesus says, I have food of, to eat of which you do not know. And his disi the dis disciples reasoned and said, has anyone brought him anything to eat? And he responded, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. We know we're sent. We know God has a will for us. We know that uh, uh, he, he wants us to finish his work and by doing the will and doing the work that we've been sent to do, it gives him glory. Fasting uh, is a lost art in the church. But fasting and prayer, there's three things that Jesus expected us to do by what he said. He said, when you give, when you pray, when you fast. Fasting and prayer together, fasting and prayer together is the quickest way, the fastest way on my own experience and the experience of many others and also in scripture. Fasting and prayer is the quickest way to kill your flesh because the strongest desire of the flesh is to eat. Strongest desire of the flesh is to eat. Oh, wow, I'm very over on time, so I'm gonna wrap this up now. Last thing, Romans 8, 13. These are all ways to, to, to lay down your life, to kill your flesh, to sow into your spirit, but it all has to start somewhere. Romans 8, 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. 
all of this has to be done by the Spirit. So we need to be led by the Spirit. We need to be filled of the Spirit. We need to be baptized in the Spirit if we truly want to lay down our life. Uh, and the last verse I'm going to give you, 1 John 2.10. He who loves his brother, he who loves his brother, and we, we already went over this. There's no greater love than this than he who would lay down his life. So he who loves his brother, he who lays down his life, who kills his flesh and sows into the spirit, abides in light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. Not a single cause. There's no, because the person who understands that they are a part of a body who has been sent to the earth to carry out the will of God and that everything they do affects the rest of the body and affects the people who aren't not part of the body yet and, and reaping a harvest of souls and seeing more people go to heaven, the person who understands that walks in the light and there's no cause for stumbling in them because they, we understand the importance of sowing into our spirit, of making our decisions with our spirit. So, I know it's a lot of scriptures. I know it's a lot of meat. Um, I'm Like I said, I will post all of this on my own personal account. You can follow me on Instagram uh, at Derek McGibbon, D-E-R-E-K-M-C-G-I-B-B-O-N. You can also follow the Embark account. They will post the, the, the notes as well. Um, these Mondays session, this session will be on YouTube under Abundant Life Whippany. Um, I also have resources, re resources that helped me through this process. There's a phenomenal book that I'd highly recommend by Kenneth Hagen called Plans, Purposes, and Pursuits. Uh, and there's also a, um, a, uh, a sermon that was given by two evangelists, uh, Jonathan and his wife Adalis Shuttlesworth, um, called How to Live in the Perfect Will of God. And this helped set me free. It was no coincidence that hearing that sermon and what he preached put a hunger in me. This is my this is my testimony. Put a hunger in me. I knew I didn't I wasn't aware of the fullness of my calling. So it put a hunger in me to seek seek the will of God. I went on a 5-day fast and it was on that 5-day fast where God called me to preach. This essential, this is not the first session that I've done. And uh, it's no coincidence I don't think that Monday session I just happened to get off 6 days of fasting and prayer pressing in for, for more of my calling, for doors to be opened, fasting and prayer, the hunger, making right choices, laying down my life, being led by the Spirit, is the only way that we can, as the body of Christ, do the work that we've been commissioned to do, do the work that we've been sent here to do. And when we realize that and we choose that, there's no cause for stumbling in us. So uh, I know you're depending on me. I'm depending on you. We need each other. We need each other and we need Christ as the head and the Holy Spirit within us. So I love you. God bless you. Follow up on those resources. If you want to watch that video by Jonathan and Adala Shuttlesworth, it's posted on my Facebook wall currently. Uh, I think I titled it, How to Live in the Perfect Will of God. Next time we're here, we're going to be talking about how you can make one decision for the rest of your life. And th this was all the foundation for that. One decision. One decision for the rest of your life. And that will carry you through. Um, so I love you. Dios te bendiga for my Spanish followers. Uh, we will see you soon. God bless you. May God richly bless you and keep you.